Welcome to WebAssembly at Google. My name is Thomas Steiner. I'm one of the three Thomases on Google's WebAssembly team. The other Thomas, Thomas Nadestad, helped prepare the presentation but could not be here physically. Um, with that, let's get going. WebAssembly at Google is a title that sounds like, oh, WebAssembly at Google, this must be complete. But Google is not two guys in a dorm anymore. Um, Google is a very big company by now. Um, the last time I checked, 181, 269,000 employees. So that's a lot. And um, we could not possibly interview all of them if they did anything with WebAssembly. But we did our best to make this as complete as possible. And then um, there's obviously also some like internal super secret but very exciting stuff happening with WebAssembly that we tried hard to get you um, onto the stage today, but some of it is just not public. So it's almost everything that can be shared was shared. And um, with that, let's dive in. Google products need to support many, many platforms. And um, this already is a good segue into the WebAssembly story. So Google products support or need to support iOS, Android, macOS, Windows, Linux, the various browsers, um, Chrome OS, which is an operating system in itself, but also a browser. So there's a lot of things we need to support. With that, let's dive into the very first topic, which is WebAssembly standardization. And Google is very active there. So Google is part of the W3C um, working groups and the community groups at uh, yeah, the W3C. We champion a bunch of proposals. Um, I've just listed them all here. So there's various stages, finished, for example, fixed width SIMD, relaxed SIMD, phase four, exception handling, memory 64, quite exciting. Phase three, JavaScript uh, prom promise integration, for example, phase two, extended name section. Phase one, um, half precision, pretty important for AI these days. So there's a bunch of things. Um, I've, uh, I will share the slide, so um, if there's anything that is linked and you wish you could click that link, um, just wait until the end of the presentation where you can see um, the QR code for downloading the slides if you're interested. So yeah, Google is very active in standardization for these various proposals in all these different stages. So let's have a look at how this typically works at Google. So Commonly, it all starts with an idea. Someone has an idea for a proposal. They work on writing that proposal down into a spec draft. And then, essentially, it's split in half. So at Google, we built V8, um, the NASM engine and the JavaScript engine. So people start implementing that proposal. At the same time, we always look for, is there an internal customer that could use this? So here, for example, Google Sheets, um, they implement that proposal in the product. Both give feedback back to the spec draft. And then eventually, once uh, everyone is happy, we ship that standard and we ship, of course, support in the product. So that's classically how it works at Google. You can see this twofold approach implementation in both the engine and in the product. Google also builds a lot of BASM infrastructure. So there's Emscripten, which probably all of you have heard of. Um, it's like the most common way to start in the world of uh, WebAssembly with a hello world written in C++ that you then compile into VASM. Emscripten supports C, C++, LLVM to WebAssembly. There's also Binarian, um, big project that is used by many um, of the other tools in the industry. Um, so in Binarian, there's a tool called VASM Opt that is used by a whole bunch of um, yeah, production tools like Dart um, in Java, J2CL, Kotlin, in Rust with uh, VASM pack. So there's a lot of infrastructure that is maintained and built by Google as well. So let's talk a bit about Binarian, the new features that are coming. So multi-threaded VASM GC is coming. Um, there will be new standard support for imported strings and for annotations. We have support for outlining. Um, there's a large update for the new exception handling proposal. Um, and also just constant work to reduce the code size and improve the speed. And let's talk about Emscripten next. Um, Emscripten LLM, uh, LLVM will get XMREF support, so same here. Um, big Endeavor is also getting TypeScript types for the complete Emscripten module so that the developer experience um, is improved. Um, we will also work on next-gen ES6 modules um, in Emscripten so that you get uh, a more modern JavaScript developer experience there. 
And um, we also work on um, designing um, and um, investigating type bindings for various web APIs. So again, that the developer experience for you as a web developer becomes better. And then likewise here, constant work to do, reduce the size of the code and improve the speed. Um, and also bundling exploration so that um, you can bundle your code more easily. But more about this um, later. Um, we also are very active in the um, library ecosystem. And um, for the libraries, typically what we want is always um, an optimized yeah, path so that, for example, we have tree shaking. So if you have a module that has a addition, subtraction, division, multiply by, and your code only uses the multiply by function, um, then of course the rest should be tree shaken away. Um, this of course leads to smaller modules. And we're also looking at code splitting, which is important if you have a web application that makes use of different um, yeah, paths of the code in different routes. Then of course it makes sense to load these paths lazily only when they're needed and not in one big massive um, blob of Java, uh, of Java, of uh, Wasm, as we're doing now in many cases. Google builds V8. I talked about this before. Um, it's Google's open source, high performance JavaScript and WebAssembly engine written in C++. It's used in Chromium, obviously, and um, in OGS. Um, there's many others. Um, <clears throat> it implements ECMAScript and WebAssembly. It needs to run on a various uh, set of engines, for example, or platforms rather, um, for example, Windows, Mac OS, Linux. Um, it uses different platform um, yeah, processor architectures like X, uh, x64, IA32, ARM, MIPS, and it can run on all of those. And um, V8 can also be embedded in um, your C++ applications if you need to do that. So let's talk about WebAssembly's uh, compilation engine or pipeline in um, V8. We start with um, the WebAssembly module that then gets um, lazily um, compiled by the liftoff engine. Um, it gets executed um, immediately, of course. But then if the code runs, the um, system will detect hot paths and hot, hot functions that it then loads um, over to the turbo fan or soon the turbo shaft, um, optimize, uh, optimizing compilers, which after, compilation, uh, after optimization um, will then just swap out the previous code that was created by um, liftoff and um, transparently um, yeah, get to ongoing executions for maximum performance then. So that's just the uh, compilation pipeline here, um, quite interesting. Let's talk about um, new features in Google's um, V8 runtime. Multi-memory support is coming, um, or actually it was uh, enabled and shipped already. Um, we have tail calls, Relax SIMD, Wasm GC, that's a big one. Um, I'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. Um, we have JS string built-ins. Um, so all of those are enabled in shipping. We have an origin trial, so that's uh, like almost shipping, so you can test it already with uh, real users for the JavaScript promise integration. And then there's, of course, a lot of things that are um, testable and implemented behind the flag. So there's memory 64 and the exception handling proposal, like the uh, uh, updated latest format one. Um, but we also still support the old format. So you can test those um, behind the flag. If you set the runtime flag, um, you can test those. So as I said, um, let's talk about Wasm GC because it's a big one. Um, typically, how does yeah, optimization work with Wasm MVP and with Wasm GC? So in the MVP case, you have the source code, you, op you run uh, language level optimizations, then you run general level optimizations, and then you have the Wasm MVP um, code. In Wasm GC, the workflow is a little bit modified typically. So you have the source code, you have the language level optimizations, then you get Wasm GC, and then you can apply the general optimizations. Why is that useful? Well, because it allows you to um, run all of those optimizations at the um, last level, at the um, general optimizations level, like the last box that we've seen here. And um, in the concrete case for um, Wasm GC, um, we typically use Wasm Opt. So you can come with any language, compile it into Wasm GC, well, any language as uh, supported by Wasm GC, obviously, compile it to Wasm GC, and then at the last stage, um, apply the general level optimizations. So that's pretty cool. In a concrete case, how does this look like? Um, for example, in Flutter, we use Dart, the Dart programming language. And um, you can see the final step here in the um, optimization um, yeah, pipeline is running the binary and optimizations until you get the final Wasm module out of a Dart module that does all the language level optimizations. Then we have the code generation to Wasm GC. And then finally, ultimately, the step to um, the binar binar binary and optimizations here. 
Um, let's talk about new features that are in Binarian, um, and specifically VASM GC optimizations. Um, escape anal analysis, devirtualization, um, we have more powerful um, dead code elimination. Um, we will have a whole program type aware content flow analysis. So there's a whole bunch of like very technical um, concepts. Again, the links to all of those um, will be in the slides that I will share at the end. So um, I can't really go into detail for any uh, of those. I also don't know much about most of those just because it's very deep, low level uh, optimizations here. Um, type pruning, type merging, um, but also then uh, type refining. Um, let's talk about a concrete language that profits from being compiled to Wasm GC, and that's Java. And um, looking at um, this final um, general level optimization step that we do with Wasm opt, like you remember the final um, box in the chart, um, we have a bunch of uh, Java um, yeah, tests and um, benchmarks that we ran. Um, you can see in yellow, this is without optimization, normalized to one. And then in green, with VASM optimizations um, applied um, in green. And you can see in all those different benchmarks, um, it makes quite a difference. Um, 2x, 1.5x, um, 1.7x, and so on. So there's a whole bunch of optimizations here um, that make sense if you think of, well, of course, we optimize the code um, with VASM opt. So it should hopefully be faster. And in practice, thankfully, um, this holds true. Let's talk about Google products next. So there's a whole bunch of Google products that make use of WebAssembly. And the oldest one is probably Google Earth. Google Earth started as a desktop application that um, was running um, yeah, on the various desktop platforms. So there uh, was a Windows XC that you could download and then run um, the Google Earth program. It was then ported onto the web with um, 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 a proprietary approach. So from um, like, yeah, first, uh, sorry, first um, we ported it to uh, mobile um, with the Android NDK and Objective C. But then in the next step, it was ported to Chrome with uh, a proprietary approach called Native Client, which then ultimately was replaced with um, the WebAssembly approach that is still active today. So now, of course, you can go to earth.google.com and um, what you see is um, the real Google Earth powered by WebAssembly. Um, WebAssembly was very much profiting from um, threads. So you can see here um, WebAssembly regular in the first um, blue chart um, had the FPS of like roughly 26 maybe. And then with threaded WebAssembly, um, you can see um, the um, FPS went up to 45. And this was a couple of years ago. So today, I guess we are pretty um, close to, if not um, better than the 60 FPS. Um, and then um, also the uh, dropped frames get improved. So here it's the other way around. Lower is better. So the less frames you need to drop, um, the better. And here we can also see that um, VASM in the threaded approach, um, yeah, more than halves the number of dropped frames. So again, this is a couple of years um, old. Um, so these days, um, most of it should not be a big problem anymore. But back then, um, the processors were slower. So this is a real important optimization. And of course, still today, um, we will all profit from those optimizations. So let me just quickly show you a comparison here. So one by one on the left, threaded. On the right, non-threaded. And um, if I play this video, you can see how the left works a lot better. Um, the right is kind of stuttering. It's kind of slow. Um, you can see there's a bunch of dropped frames. So it's a lot less smooth than the threaded one. So let's just wait for this to finish. Yep, here we go. Um, so yeah, Google Earth um, was one of the first projects at Google that was um, ported at scale to WebAssembly. The next one is Google Sheets. And um, I told you before um, in the intro slide, Google, Sh Google Sheets needs to run on various platforms. So we have, of course, the mobile apps on iOS, on Android. And then we have the um, desktop apps. So how do you do that? Um, well, of course, you try to share as much code as possible. In Google Sheets, there's something called the Calc Worker, which does all the calculations. And this calculation worker was initially, um, well, so still is written in Java, that was initially compiled to Clojure.js, so to JavaScript, um, with a compiler called J2CL that had certain limitations. And now um, with um, VASM GC, we could compile from Java directly into VASM GC. 
And um, we saw a speed improvement of 1.8x on large sheets. Um, if you're interested and want to debug this, um, you can actually just open Google Sheets and look for um, the WebAssembly module in the network tab. So you can just see the uh, WebAssembly module directly. Um, so 1.8 um, compared to what we had with JavaScript. Um, and that's definitely something that is worthwhile and makes a big, big uh, speed improvement um, that was very noticeable to users. So Wasm GC um, well, uh, was an, a key enabler here. And you remember from the beginning when I talked about um, standardization, Wasm uh, GC was accompanied by here Google Sheets as the product. Um, and yeah, you can see collaboration between V8 Sheets and the J2CL project, so the compiler um, that in the end um, yeah, was able to compile directly from Java to Java uh, to Wasm to GC. Um, there's a various uh, bunch of uh, optimizations that um, we applied and tested. Um, in the chart here, you can see no optimizations normalized to one. Other regular optimizations didn't make a big, big impact. But then finally, speculative inlining was the one optimization that really uh, moved the trigger forward and then compiled, compi sorry, combined with the other uh, optimizations, um, we got to um, yeah, the current most optimized 1.x speed improvement optimization um, level that we have now. Google Photos, um, big other Google uh, product. And of course, again, we have this needs to run on the web, needs to run on um, the various mobile platforms, iOS, Android come to mind. And um, <clears throat> with all these different code bases, we of course want to share as much code as possible again. So this is write once, run anywhere, um, brought up uh, like in the panel before as a joke, but it's in this case not really a joke. It's actually something that we at Google try to profit from as much as possible. Um, in Google Photos, you have the various photo editing tools. So you can um, yeah, make a photo more dynamic or apply some sort of HDR filter and what have you. So all of those image processing um, filters all make use of SIMD um, to get optimal performance. And um, it is, of course, different UI, but in the end, the same business logic that powers those um, image editing features on the web and also in the mobile applications. So pretty cool here. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about like some of the optimizations that we see. Um, so there was a limit in um, the address, addressable um, yeah, memory that you could use with um, WebAssembly. In the beginning, it was two gigabytes. Now it's four gigabytes. And um, it was very clearly visible. Um, you can see the red arrow here um, when the limit was increased to four gigabytes, so double the memory. Luckily, the out of memory errors halved, so great correlation here. We could arrest more memory, which means we could um, yeah, proce process bigger photos, which then in the end meant the out of memory issues and errors halved. So great su success story here, where we can really, really see if we look at um, the dashboard, it clearly did have an impact. The moment we rolled this out, the number of errors halved. And um, of course, this will um, profit even more from the memory 64 proposal, where we then will finally get 46, uh, 64, sorry, 64 bit uh, pointer, pointers. So this will allow us to um, modify and uh, yeah, edit even larger photos. The next product I want to call about is, uh, want to talk about is uh, Google Meet. So hate it or love it, um, we spend a lot of time in meetings. And um, one of the core features, of course, that you profit from meetings is echo cancellation. And um, we use SIMD for doing that. Um, and let me just play you a sample. So first you hear without optimization, and then you hear with echo um, cancellation optimization. So let me play that. Can you hear me clearly? It's getting scared. We'll be updating the figures in section 11.7 by 9 a.m. tomorrow. And this, by the way, is also a lot of uh, background noise removal. So sometimes I would do, so I work from home typically. Um, so sometimes I would hear the neighbor's dogs and they would drive me crazy. And I would apologize to um, my meeting partners and say like, sorry, if there's dog barking, it's uh, our neighbors. And they wouldn't even hear. So sometimes you wish you sat at the other end of the VC <laughs> to not hear what is going on in the outside world. So pretty impressive here what uh, SIMD can do for just these various optimizations. Um, but Google Meet is, of course, also your optics, not just uh, the audio. Um, it's also the optics. Um, we use SIMD for studio lighting um, on desktops. So you can see here how I'm placing virtual studio lights. And you can, of course, do this at home um, if you've never discovered the feature. You can place virtual studio lights, and you can see how this purple light, for example, gets reflected 
on um, her cheek. So that's pretty cool. Um, you can apply, yeah, studio lighting here. So let me just wait for this to play again. Custom, and then you place the various virtual lights onto the canvas here. So pretty cool, enabled by Simd. Um, Simd is also a core enabler for a cool feature called background blurring um, that allows you to first, of course, blur, blur your background, but then also um, apply a different background if you want to. Um, working from home also means people see your messy apartment, so people put themselves typically into like a shiny uh, zen cafe or something. So all of this enabled by, um, yeah, in the end, Simd, but also in the end by AI. So for this to work, the AI needs to figure out what is the person and what is the background. So the task is called background separation. And for this, we use a library called Media Pipe. Um, I will talk about this in a couple more uh, minutes in more detail. But um, for now, Media Pipe is uh, um, yeah, the library that enables this. Um, for background blurring and swapping, we use um, a mask model called MobileNet V3 Small, um, exported to TensorFlow Lite using a float 16 quantization, so reduced um, precision, but still it works well enough, um, which already reduces the model size by 50% just by um, making it less precise, um, which results in a slight loss in weight precision, but it's still rarely or barely noticeable um, and gives us a 2x speed improvement. And then of course we also can play with shrinking the input image until we get a good enough segmentation mask that dynamically skips um, yeah, the refinements. So for example, if I am on a VC, the model also dy dynamically determines, oh, I don't have hair, so I'm just an egg uh, in front of the camera. So for me, a very simple oval mask is good enough. If someone has very curly hair, super uh, stylish haircut, for, exam for example, the uh, mask, of course, dynamically needs to adapt and um, yeah, be a little bit more refined so that the hair don't get part of um, the background. So this is just a um, dynamic process here. Um, and of course, we can also play with battery life. So if you see battery life is uh, getting critical, um, we can dynamically reduce the quality of the mask um, so that you still get your background separated um, at maybe the expense of having your fancy haircut be part of the background blur, but your battery will then run longer. All right, and with that, let's talk about libraries. Um, I just mentioned the first one, which is Media Pipe. Um, Media pipe, you can test this um, um, directly on your devices. So here, for the sake of uh, making a joke of my hair and Thomas Nadestad, the other guy, also is uh, as bald as I am, uh, maybe even more, um, we ran this hair detection model and um, you can see it detected a couple of hair still on my, on my head here. Um, and yeah, of course, this needs to run on the various platforms. So we have Android, iOS, um, we have the web, um, but it can also even run on IoT and on the edge. Um, so all made possible by the Media Pipe library here. Um, next, we have TensorFlow, which is uh, what most people on the web have encountered as TensorFlow.js. And TensorFlow.js has a BASM backend. Um, why do we still new, uh, use this? Well, because many devices, especially mobile devices, don't have a good enough or sometimes even don't have a GPU. So running stuff on the CPU for the foreseeable future remains very important still. Um, this can even outperform WebGL's backend because spinning up the shader execution um, um, takes, uh, yeah, has some, just some overhead um, because you need to yeah, spin up the shader. So sometimes just staying on the CPU can be faster. Um, TensorFlow.js uses SIMD through a library called uh, XNNPack, um, quick sidetrack, XNNPack, highly optimized solution for neural network interface, uh, sorry, inference on ARM x86 X and WebAssembly, um, and also RISC-V. Uh, um, it's a library that is not meant to be directly consumed and used. It's meant to be um, yeah, uh, used by higher level abstractions like TensorFlow Lite, TensorFlow.js, PyTorch, Onyx Runtime, and um, as I mentioned before, MediaPipe. And it supports VASM MVP, VASM SIMD, VASM Relaxed SIMD in an experimental form, but it does. And um, of course, the more um, you optimize, the faster your inference tasks get. So this is uh, XNNPack. Um, now, finally, for TensorFlow, um, looking at the various backends. Um, so it is a little bit complex here. So um, blue is WebGL, red is WebAssembly, yellow is WebAssembly plus SIMD, 
and green is member assembly plus simd plus thread. Um, lower is better here, so we ran different uh, benchmarks. Um, MobileNet v2 and Blazeface, and you can see in the end um, the uh, WebGL is typically the fastest, but um, in most cases it can be outperformed by going the VASM simd plus threads route, and typically also even um, VASM and simd alone is faster than WebGL. So um, with that, over to like where is this useful? Um, TensorFlow on the web is used by Photoshop on the web. Um, and Photoshop on the web uses TensorFlow for its object selection tool. So you can see in this animation here, um, I am selecting the apple. And um, for this, yeah, the model needs to, of course, understand what is the object here. And um, we, um, or actually Photoshop rather, um, can do this directly on the client. So your image data does not need to be sent to Adobe for running this in the cloud. No, it can run all locally in the client thanks to um, this uh, TensorFlow model that is then, um, or TensorFlow um, engine that is then running the model locally, which means, of course, for Adobe, it's faster. They don't need to uh, maintain a server. They don't need to perform this on um, their cloud. It's more private for you as a user. And of course, the application can also work offline. So pretty cool use case here for um, Photoshop on the web with TensorFlow. Um, a library that a lot of Google products use is Ink. Um, it does what it says on a tin. It allows you to um, yeah, use um, a freestyle um, input handler, like a stylus, for example, and draw vector graphics um, on a canvas here, which is useful for note taking, for marking up content, um, for communicating, so you can uh, communicate by just drawing something. And um, there's a quote where it says essentially, um, it's likely we just wouldn't have supported the web without WebAssembly. So WebAssembly truly as an enabler technology here for this low-end inking library that is then usable on these various platforms. So there's Chrome Canvas. Um, it's Chrome OS built-in drawing app that uses ink with Google Classroom, where you can imagine, of course, um, if students get um, PDFs, they can annotate those um, in, uh, in the educational space. Google Keep, um, our note-taking application um, that is generally uh, also deployed on various platforms, so on the web, on iOS, on Android, uses ink for sketch notes and for an annotating images if you um, want to do this. Um, you can, with Google Photos, mark up images. Um, and YouTube also has um, uh, a feature where you can draw stories um, on the YouTube iOS application. So all of this powered by ink. Um, the next big library is Skia or slash Canvas Kit. So Skia is a graphics library that was compiled to WebAssembly, um, where it's typically running under the name of uh, Canvas Kit. It's an open source 2D graphics lib um, that provides common APIs that work across a variety of uh, hardware and software platforms. And um, it serves as a graphics engine for Google Chrome and Chrome OS on Android and for Flutter in Compose multi-platform and many other products. Um, it offers a WebAssembly build for um, easy deployment of its graphics APIs on the web. It means you can have powerful, fast graphics without having to write WebGL code. So where is this being used? Um, there's JetBrains, Kotlin, Wasm, Compose multi-platform feature or tool um, where essentially you compile Kotlin to Wasm GC and build your UI with Compose multi-platform, which is their product for building um, user interfaces. And it uses Canvas Kit for pixel-perfect rendering with something called Skiko, which is, um, yeah, again, the library compiled to WebAssembly. Um, there's a talk by uh, Zalim Basharov um, from JetBrains at Vazmayo that you can watch um, that explains how this works. So this is JetBrains um, that use um, Skiko um, Canvas Kit in the end. And um, at Google, we use it in Flutter. Um, so Dart is compiled to Vasm GC, as I told you before. And it uses Canvas Kit for pixel-perfect rendering with its Dart Skia bridge. So you can see here um, on the left-hand side um, the application code in Dart, the Flutter framework in Dart, the Flutter web engine in Dart, which then gets compiled to Vasm GC. So main Dart Vasm is the file. And then the Skia bridge is uh, compiled to SK Vasm in linear memory. And um, shameless plug again for my colleague's talk at um, Vasmayo in Barcelona um, last, what was it, June, I think. Um, I might be wrong. Um, where, where he explained how this works. You can see an example here where um, they took the Material, material 3 
um, design kit, implemented it in Flutter, and you can just work with this directly on the web, thanks to um, Canvas Kit. So, closing thoughts. Google really, really loves WebAssembly. I hope this became clear. Um, and again, this is not every everything. There's some internal cool stuff that I couldn't share. But truly, this idea of writing once and then just running anywhere is super important for a big company like Google. So we hate building stuff twice or three times even if there's already one common logic, one common business logic that we can use. Um, and I've hopefully motivated through the various examples how this looks like in practice today. Google Photos, Google Sheets, all of those products that have business logic that is highly complex. Google Meet with the, Im with the image and sound optimizations. So all of this powered by WebAssembly. Internally, we bet heavily on WebAssembly. Visibly, so the stuff that we shared today, but also hidden behind the curtains. Um, there's some folks, maybe can the core VASM folk quickly stand up? Um, yes, or wave something. So if you want to like hear some of the internal use cases, talk to these people. Maybe they can share something, maybe not. Um, so talk to them. Um, there's super cool internal stuff also happening. Um, so the people who have been waving here, um, talk to them if you are interested in the behind the curtains stuff. But again, um, they may just say, no, we can't share it. But um, I teased, so maybe they will, if you buy them a beer or something, uh, tell you something more. Um, Google was an early um, adopter of WebAssembly. So we bet on it from day one, essentially. Um, early on with products like Google Earth, um, that was really when WebAssembly was yeah, not quite the success story as it is, as it is today. It was a bit of a risk, um, but we knew sort of that it was coming. Um, so with that, um, yeah, I hope you still believe that Google um, really does love WebAssembly. Um, thank you very much. Um, there's this QR code or also the short URL, goo.gle slash basmcon2024, if you want to get the slides. And um, yeah, again, this is co-prepared by my colleague Thomas Nadesat, who couldn't be here today. Um, but if there's questions, I'm more than happy to take those. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> so the gentleman with the blue shirt has the microphone. If there's there questions, question. there's one over there. Yep. Uh, hello, thank you for the talk. Uh, you showed the slides where uh, you compared WASM and WASM with threads, and they got its uh, in, like implementation in V8, and it's uh, not standardized. And uh, how how long ago you added it there uh, at Google? Um, so let me get to the very beginning with the various proposals. Let's see. Uh, rep, here we go. Um, so I guess the faces um, are sort of an indication for where we are with the various proposals. Um, so there's an interesting one, um, shared everything threads, which is only in phase one. But I know that there's a lot of people very interested in this. So maybe um, this will move forward faster. Sometimes something is just stuck in, uh, a very, uh, in one of the faces for a long time um, because I don't know, something happens, no inter implemented interest or things just are incredibly hard. Um, so my proposal would be, if there's an, a proposal you are very interested in, um, click to, like you have the slide link, click to one of the uh, links, um, subscribe to the repo, contribute if you don't already, um, and then just see where um, the proposal you're interested in is in the standards phase. Um, it's also always worthwhile to just look at browser flags. So browsers typically implement stuff before you can really test it, um, so like test it safely, if, uh, if you will. So, for example, in uh, in Chrome, there's this flag called um, Experimental WebAssembly Features that gives you access to some of the not maybe potentially still unstable uh, features, but they are testable already. Um, Firefox, Safari have something similar. Um, the ways of enabling those flags is different per browser vendor. But if you're interested in in um, testing early, definitely see if maybe some of the browser vendors have implemented already. Okay, thank you. Quick follow up. And uh, what can I like? Can I use mscripten to compile to Wasm with threads so it would run on V8? Like uh, wh where it's available? Like how can I try it myself on the V8? Um, I think that's a question mostly for the um, mscripten team. So mscripten supports p threads. Um, I'm not entirely sure what you want to um, play with or test. Um, but yeah, definitely talk to the Emscripten folks. Um, they're very responsive. If you open an issue and ask, 
um, they are very likely going to help you. Yeah, thank you. All right. Other questions? I think someone in the very last row raised their hand. Yep. You mentioned that uh, you mentioned that uh, you are uh, compiling Java to WebAssembly. Uh, Wait, I'm not saying he was who's speaking. Uh, this is it's oh, me. Yeah, okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, you mentioned that you're compiling Java to WebAssembly. Uh, I didn't know that uh, we couldn't do that. Like. Uh, yes. Um. So that's um pretty new. It's open source, so you can try this at home if you want to. Um. Let me just find the slide. Um. Google Sheets. Here we go. Um. So there's the J2CL project. And inside the J2CL project, there is the J2VASM um, tool that you can use to run this. Um, it compiles Java to Java uh, to VASM GC, so it's not running on all browsers quite yet because um, Safari, um, like if you have technology preview in Safari, um, you can run it, um, but it's not rolled out in stable yet. Um, but yeah, so this is possible. Um, definitely check out the repository with uh, the example that they have there. Uh, a follow-up question. So, uh, does it mean that if uh, a particular runtime, like Wasm time, eventually supports Wasm GC, this can run there? This Java code can run there? I guess the devil is always in the detail. So, um, for example, you would probably need to hook up some of the graphical interfaces to something um, that Wasm time can support. Um, so, if you run Wasm time on a server, there's obviously no no canvas um, by default, so you need to think of uh, how can how can this work. Um, but it, in theory, yeah, if uh, you s purely stick to um, like mathematical processing, for example, of, of Java, this should hopefully work. So um, as always, the devil might be in the details, but um, yeah, so far what I've heard is uh, it's a pretty uh, complete uh, compiler. So it's not a toy version of Java; it's uh, the real Java. Um, and in practice, we have rolled it out um, with Google Sheets, and that's one of the most complex, I guess, uh, calculation engines um, that you can think of. But yeah, like, go to the repository, check there, um, open an issue if you're interested in um, hearing more. Um, I'm not a super, super expert in this field, but okay. yeah, it should work in theory. Okay. Uh, uh, last uh, question. Uh, like, I was just wondering, where, did you have to? Did you face any limitations? Like, only certain kind of code would work. Like, reflection wouldn't work, and all of that. Or, I know. That's something I need to refer to uh, the okay. repo owners. I just am not that deep into that topic. But um, yeah, the link is in the slides if you're interested.